é o meu orientador de tese, uh, isso é porreiro, portanto ele é especialista no BFR, tem mais de 50 artigos um, publicados, portanto acho que devíamos todos aproveitar, uh, é da fisiologia, tem, tem muito conhecimento nessa área, portanto aproveitem, no final era giro ter muita discussão, uh, porque é um pouco de conhecimento, portanto vamos aproveitar este, este momento que, é, que acho que vai ser muito valioso para todos, ok? Stephen, whenever you want, we are ready. Okay, thank you very much, Joel. Um, hopefully, everybody can understand my strong Irish accent. Um, if there's anything you don't understand, feel free to ask me a question at any stage as well. Um, today, I'm going to just give you a, a sort of overview of blood flow restriction training. I'm going to sort of cover some of the stuff that we've done, including other people's work also, but to give you an idea of how we think it can be used to rehabilitate from injury. Um, it is a little bit general, but as I said, we can sort of maybe delve into a little bit more depth in the questions at the end, if there's anything specific that you would, you know, you're interested in knowing. So two main areas that I'm going to cover, I'm going to cover the, the sort of basic science of blood flow restriction training, what it is, how we respond and how we adapt, and what are the main adaptations that you would expect to see from this type of training. And with that knowledge, then that allows you to then consider how you then implement it with regards to rehabilitation. Um, and there's two areas that we will look at both during loaded exercise and unloaded exercise. So when I first started research in this area over 10 years ago, there was very little on the market with regards to being able to actually wonder how we were going to do it. And um, if we just look now, these are just some of the um, equipment makers that are out there. And it's not to sort of say one's better than the other, but it's just to show you that what is out there and what's in the literature. Um, you've got your pneumatic cuff, cuff in the top left, and there's a few different systems which will automate um, pressures. It will allow you to set the pressure individually and so on, um, all by the touch of a button. Um, and obviously the most expensive end of things, you've got your handheld inflation devices in the top right here. Um, again, there's lots of companies now on market in these devices. Um, in order to set the pressure, you probably have to use a standard um, pressure unit in order to, um, or Doppler in order to be able to determine blood flow and so on. Um, but you can inflate the, the cuff and um, they're, a lot, they're a bit cheaper. You've got Katsu cuffs, which are um, the original name for blood flow restriction, obviously is Katsu in, in Japanese. Um, I said when we first started, the literature was mainly done using katsu cuffs, but they weren't available to the general public and um, you couldn't get access to them and um, they have become available now. Difference between these and a lot of the other cuffs is they're a lot thinner, they're only three to five centimeters in width, um, which can have implications for the pressures that you then use whenever you apply this and we can talk about that in a few slides. And then the final version is the bottom right hand corner, um, which are the knee wraps and different wraps where you just tighten them up around the limbs. There's a little bit of research to show that they are they work in that they still restrict blood flow like everything else. But these are the ones I would keenly ask you to stay away from and not use and um, because mainly because we don't know what pressure we're applying and we're running the risk of causing some um, injury just by applying too much pressure for a period of time. As I said, there is literature which show that it does work, but that's because we're restricting blood flow. But I would say there's also probably more information not in the literature where people have probably damaged themselves or caused harm by using them. So from a basic science perspective, sort of what do we see and what do we expect? Well, essentially blood flow restriction exercises when we perform exercise with partial um, restriction of blood flow to the limb. And what it means is we prevent the blood returning back to the heart. So at no stage are we ever trying to fully stop all blood flow into that muscle. We're only trying to um, reduce it by a certain amount. One of the advantages, of course, with this is that we are able to use very light loads in order to gain adaptation. So in this case, anywhere between 20 and 40% of your one adaptation max. And most of the research is sitting in around that sort of 30% mark now. Um, from a pressure perspective, if we look back to the early days, we were sort of using... Um, just random pressures, um, and a lot of it based off the original Katsu research. But as I mentioned before, they were using different size cups. Everybody in the literature is using different size cups, and that can have an impact on the pressure that's required. So we started to standardize that more, 
and what we use what's known as limb occlusive pressure. So if we think of um, limb occlusive pressure is the minimum pressure to fully stop all blood flow into that muscle, and we equate that as 100%. Therefore, if we work at between 40 and 80% of that limb occlusive pressure, we can um, get a we know that there's still blood flow going into that muscle and then we're standardizing that across the board. So if you're using one set of cuffs one day and it's 40% limb occlusive pressure and use another set of cuffs the next time and measure the 40%, you're working at the same intensity and same standard, just as you would if you're using the same load when we're exercising. We generally tend to restrict the blood flow continuously with no recovery and no release between um, sets. And this normally lasts between five and 10 minutes. And the reps and set schemes are normally the standard scheme, which is in the literature, which is 30 reps of the first set, 30 seconds recovery, and then 15, 15, and 15 repetitions. So a total of 75 repetitions. And actually, that's actually a, a very nice method to use, especially in a rehab setting, mainly because we have a situation where we maybe have someone returning from injury or surgery, and actually we don't have the ability to test their you know, maximal strength out or so on. So we don't know what load specifically to set them at. But actually, within one session, we already know what intensity and what level that person is at. So for example, if they can get only 30 or 40 repetitions, but we know the load's too heavy, and we now have to start reducing um, the load in order for them to get their repetitions in. If they're able to get 75 repetitions and it was very easy, then obviously the next time they come back, we can increase the load quite a lot. So we have a, an ability just with that 75 rep scheme to sort of manipulate the load within one session, which is obviously going to be advantageous from a, from a rehab setting. So how do we apply pressure? As I said, in the early days, there was no standardized pressure. And if you look in the literature, there's anywhere between 80 and 300 millimeter mercury, which is a, you know, a really wide range. And again, that's also dependent on whether it's the upper body um, or the lower body and which muscles you're using. And the issues mainly were due with the cuff widths. As I mentioned, you've got katsu cuffs, which are three centimeters. And then you had people who were using cuffs they had for blood pressure measuring, which was a lot wider and they're up to 20 centimeters. So obviously that's got a big variation on what's going to happen um, if we're going to sort of apply the pressure. So if we apply 300 millimeters of mercury with a three centimeter cuff and with a 20 centimeter cuff, that's going to give a different physiological response. So the solution is to use limb occlusive pressure, which is what they use during surgery. And they say that's the minimum pressure required for complete occlusion of arterial blood flow. And essentially that is 100%. And so if we work back from that, we can then get away with using 40 to 80% as a standard, which then allows us to um, make sure there's blood going in, but it gives us a standardized pressure. And we can either measure this manually using the Doppler or some of those automated systems have, a, have it already built in. They've got the technology to, to measure um, blood flow um, via the tourniquet systems themselves. So um, you can measure it with the touch of a button. So the more expensive the unit, the more um, measuring capability it has and it allows you to do that. Um, as I said, it just allows standardization across different cuff widths and different types. And also from a research perspective, we can now really properly compare different studies now because we now can say, well, that group worked at 60% of limb occlusion pressure, and this study was also the same, vice versa, if something was lighter or sort of higher or lower, again, it may explain different findings, whereas when it was just a, an arbitrary pressure, we really couldn't understand. One thing that we have done is we have done some work, and there's a couple of other groups that have done the same. We've looked at sort of the measurement of limb occlusion pressure in different body positions, um, and very straightforward, simply, you can see the in the bottom left here, we've got someone lying down, seated, and then standing. Um, and if you go from the position on the left to the position on the right, as it is on my screen, hopefully, um, there is an increase in pressure. So from that perspective, um, we would generally argue that you measure the limb occlusive pressure as best you can in the position that you're going to do the exercise. Okay, so um, that would then have that um, ability to, to help you sort of get closer to the, the real true pressure. So what happens then when we apply pressure? Well, this is just a, a really simple um, figure which shows oxygenation of the muscle itself. 
And if we look at, um, this is tissue oxygenation, so measured from a, a NEARS device, and zero just means both it's rest, okay? So we've just standardized it so it's at rest. And we've got a, a dashed line, which is our normal exercise, and the solid line is blood flow restriction, okay? And if we just look at the dashed line first, in this case, it's 20% of your one repetition max. And you can see, once you start exercising, we get a decrease in oxygenation. We get these little fluctuations, and that's just your repetitions. Once you finish the exercise, it comes back up to zero again. We actually get a slight overshoot. That's basically because we've now got an exercise hyperemia because the muscle has got more blood flow. We then restart again. We get a decrease again, back down until we, ex we stop exercise, it comes back to normal. So that's two sets. The magnitude of difference between here and here and here and here is exactly the same. It's just that it hasn't been recalibrated in between. If we then look at what happens with blood flow restriction, we can see that once we inflate the cuff, we actually get a little bit of an increase. That's mainly because the pressure shunting some blood into the area. Then we start um, getting a decrease until we start exercising. We get an even greater decrease here, down to about 50%. But what's important is the cuff is not released in between the exercise, and it starts to creep back up, but it never, ever goes back to resting levels again. So by the time you start the second set, there's less oxygen within the muscle. Therefore, you're working in a local hypoxia. Okay, so there's local hypoxia within the muscle. Then we get this decrease again, and it's only when you release the cuff here does it return back to zero. Now that's only two sets. As I said, this continues on for, for four sets whenever we do um, normal blood flow restriction exercise. Um, and so we're working with this sort of local hypoxia that's occurring within the muscle itself. So from an adaptation perspective, what do we see? Well, the sort of main driver and the main thing that we were everyone was really interested in the beginning was this idea of increasing muscle mass. The inventor and Professor Sato who invented the blood flow restriction and our capsule training, he was a bodybuilder and his main idea was to increase muscle mass. Um, there's a study from Takarada way back in 2000, so not very new, 20 years old now, um, and showing this is blood flow restriction in the black bars, high intensity exercise, which is 80% of your one repetition max and low intensity exercise. This is 16 weeks, um, elbow flexion, so bicep curls twice a week. And you can see with the BFR, we're getting about a 20% increase in cross-sectional area as measured for MRI, which is the equivalent of what we see with high intensity training. And both are significantly greater than low intensity training. So what we tend to see is we see that muscle size increases to the same extent as heavy load training with blood flow restriction. So we can get as good a response with blood flow restriction for muscle hypertrophy. Um, and that's been shown time and time again um, in the literature. One of the other potential advantages with this sort of mode of training from a hypertrophy perspective is if we look at normal sort of physiological textbooks um, and even literature, it's suggested hypertrophy normally starts to happen a little bit later on. So sort of four, six, eight weeks down the line of training. One of the things that we're able to do with blood flow restriction training is get those adaptations a little bit earlier. Now, it's not that it's magical and it's better than anything else. The main reason is because the loads are light, we can then use it with a higher frequency. So we can use it more often. So there's some research out there which is using it once or twice a day for a short two to three week period and getting the same gains in muscle mass as you would get after sort of 12 to 14 weeks of heavy load training. Okay. Now, as I said, if you continue that on for longer, you're not going to get any, any greater adaptations. You sort of maxed out what the adaptation that you're going to get from that mode of training. Um, as I said, it's not magical. If you work out, um, they normally train for five days and have two days off. So they take the weekend off and they train twice a day. And over a three week period, that accounts to about sort of 20, 24 sessions of exercise. And if you consider if we train three times a week for eight to 10 weeks, that's a similar number of sessions that we're doing. So it's not that you, it's any better. It's just that you can condense the, the training into a shorter period, which allows you to, to get that gain. So it's not that, and that's a way, that's something that's used rarely. It's not used all the time, but it could work in some rehab settings if you have to get muscle mass back quickly um, and other factors. There's, there's, potential use there but it really depends on the injury or who you're working with or so on whether that's needed 
most people can just go through the standard two or three weeks, three, two or three times a week training and get the normal adaptations that you'd expect to see. Obviously, if you get a change in muscle size, you would hope and expect to get some change in muscle strength also. And again, that's been shown pretty consistently with blood flow restriction training. Again, there's an early study from Takarada again in 2002. And this is in, this is an elite rugby player. So these are well-trained individuals. And these are just sort of um, knee extensor torque values following um, low intensity control exercise versus low intensity blood flow restriction exercise. And these are just taken at different velocities on a dynamometer. So isometric right through the different speeds. And the control group had a, a non-significant increase of a 3% improvement, where we got about a 14% increase in the um, BFR group across the board. I said these were well-trained individuals, so that's a, a good change over that sort of eight-week training period. Um, and again, strength is one of those ones that's a bit unsure how to sort of look at it in, from a point of view of, if you have someone who's relatively untrained, they obviously get a big increase in strength, whereas if you have someone who's trained, they get a smaller increase. But obviously, there's a, um, there is a consistent increase in strength across the board. The one area where it, we, we are more or less confident of, the strength adaptations that we see with blood flow restriction are not as good as heavy load training. Okay, so whilst we do get stronger, they are not to the same extent as we get with heavy load training. And that's probably mainly due to the, a lot of the neural adaptations that you get with heavy load training that we don't see with blood flow restriction exercise. So again, I'm not here to say blood flow restriction is this magic bullet. It's the only thing you can do. It's just a, a stepping stone whenever you can't load heavy and then you start introducing it until the point where you can start loading heavy again. That's always the ultimate aim is to start making them load heavier to get, um, we don't want them to use cuts and blood flow restriction devices for the rest of their lives. We're just wanting to use it for an early stage to allow them to rehabilitate quicker or better. One of the other areas um, that we're aware of from an adaptations perspective is that we also see some vascular adaptations. Um, this is some work from my PhD a long time ago, it feels like now. Um, and we were looking at um, changes in blood flow with blood flow restriction exercise. Um, if I think back, we had a really hard time trying to convince people that this was actually happening in the fact that the reviewers were more worried we were restricting blood flow, so how was it causing an adaptation? But if we think about a lot of things with physiology, when we restrict one thing, that's where we get the actual adaptation from. It actually drives some of the, you know, the sensors and so on, and we get sort of gene responses and so on that actually upregulate things which then create adaptations. Um, and our work was just, we did this in a range of studies, and we looked at different um, training in the plantar flexors, um, and we got um, an increase in post-occlusive blood flow um, after exercise, which was an indication of changes within the number of capillaries. And then Judy Hunt, who did her PhD after me at Loughborough, um, she actually was able to measure changes in um, calf filtration capacity, which is a measure of capillarization, and then also do some biopsy work to show some changes in the number of capillaries. So we think that there's a, there's a greater number of capillaries within the muscle after this type of training. And to be fair, there is after all types of training. Um, it just depends whether or not, um, if you get an increase in muscle mass, it normally increases to a greater extent to compare to the number of capillaries. So therefore it looks like you're decreasing, but you're not necessarily. Julie also demonstrated that the artery of the, um, in this case of the elbow flexor actually increased in size also. So the diameter of the artery also increased with this type of training. And um, so there's actually both growth in the periphery of the muscle, but there's also growth um, in, the, in the vasculature itself, um, in this case, in the arteries. And that's usually caused by this change in what's known as vascular endothelial growth factor, which is just a, um, a gene that's upregulated and is sort of responsible for increasing the number of capillaries within the muscle. So there, there's not been a lot of work in this area, but there's some arguments around the idea of trying to create an increase in local muscular endurance because we can get increase in blood flow, we can get increases from in some of these things, and um, we may be able to sort of um, improve that in some aspects. So I haven't covered the mechanisms, mainly because I wanted to cover some of the applications of rehab, and we, um, I'm, I'm also wary of time. I don't want to keep you too long and sort of bore you for a long time. But as I said, we can talk about the mechanisms afterwards if you've got any questions, but 
you know, there's a lot of things out there with regards to increasing protein synthesis and um, changes in satellite cell activation. Um, and probably the biggest driver is we've got an increase in EMG and so muscle activity and um, with blood flow restriction and um, even with those low loads. Partly because of fatigue and partly because of that hypoxia, that sort of mixture is causing that sort of increase in the, um, in the recruitment of those faster twitch fibers. And as I said, we know that generally happens because one, we can see it from EMG studies, but also we can see it from muscle hypertrophy studies. If we take a muscle biopsy, um, we can see that type two fibers, those faster twitch fibers have actually increased in size. And they won't increase in size unless they've been recruited. So we know they've had to be recruited during the exercise in order for them to grow. And um, so um, there's sort of some of the potential mechanisms around. It. So how can we then go about applying it? Well, I'll start off at the basic end of whenever you have someone who maybe can't load at all. That means, and then we'll go right through to the resistance exercise itself. So the first area that potentially can have some sort of impact is around the idea of preventing muscle atrophy and um, whenever someone is either immobilized or in bed rest actually probably a pretty good time at the minute we're all stuck in our houses and actually we're unless we're moving unless we're doing lots of exercise we're running a risk of actually reducing um our muscle mass and obviously those people who are in unfortunately in hospital with different with COVID-19 they maybe are have a big risk of obviously losing lots of muscle mass when they're in bed and ICU and so on. So this is a study from Takarada in 2000. Um, this is actually a, an ACL study. This is a, a group of patients who had um, ACL su surgery, but they then put them in bed for 14 days in hospital. So this is a really bad ACL study and that, that's not what we would do nowadays. Um, but we'll treat it as a, an immobilization study or a bed rest study, more so. And all they did was they put them in, in bed and they essentially they had their operation, had their MRI, and then they had 10 days of blood flow restriction or control, and then they had another scan. And you can see here, in a 24-hour period, they had the breakfast. They then had their first bout of blood flow restriction, which was passive, so no exercise, just the cuff applied, lunch, and then another bout later on in the afternoon. And the, Protocol was essentially the inflated day pressure, three minutes of rest, five minutes on, three minutes rest, repeated five times. Okay, and essentially what that was was a pressure that equated to a hundred percent of your limb occlusive pressure. Okay, so this stage we're talking about fully restricting blood flow completely, and then releasing it for a period of time afterwards. And it's essentially very similar to another um, similar protocol, which is ischemic preconditioning, which people would use for and other health factors and also sport and performance. So it's full occlusion and then release repeated for a number of cycles twice a day. And you can see here in the control group, they lost anywhere between 10 and 20% of muscle mass as measured by MRI. But if we then look at the experimental group, they attenuated that loss by about half. So they lost less than half of the, the muscle mass in that sort of 10 day period. So obviously there's some potential benefit there. And um, there was a few follow-up studies in that. Um, Krubata, a couple of studies in an Australian journal who looked at immobilization of the limb itself, and they were able to demonstrate again that um, this potentially had some benefit around the preventing some of the strength losses that you would see during a, a sort of five, 10 day immobilization period. The only thing I would say about this is it hasn't really been looked at in a great deal since. And that's always a little bit of a worry in that if this is so good, um, why is it not? We've done some research um, in intensive care patients, and well, it wasn't really that strong. There's a there's a study out of a Brazilian group who have done something similar, but they've used um, passive exercise. So they had the physiotherapists moving the patients who are in intensive care, and they've moved their limbs around whilst having the cuffs applied. So and they have shown some good benefits benefits of that. So there is this potential of um, if there's if you obviously add the exercise, you get a bit more than just the passive in its own. But there's there's some potential there, but we just haven't seen enough to fully say um, it's useful. But we, if we can obviously stop some loss, that's going to be beneficial. One of the ways that we then potentially could do this if we had um, the cough on, but without having to then physically do exercise, so if someone couldn't, is obviously use neuromuscular electrical stimulation. 
Um, and there's been a number of studies now um, looking at this study by Natsumi, another study by Gorgi et al. Um, and in this case, they looked at neuromuscular electrical stim with neuromuscular stim and blood flow restriction. And again, at very low intensity. So the intensity of stimulation equated to about 5 to 10% of your maximal voluntary contraction. So very, very low. And in this case, it was 23 minutes twice a day for two weeks. And you can see we had a you know, nearly 4% increase in muscle thickness and up to a 14% increase in strength, um, depending on the sort of different measures of strength itself. And as I said, the, the Gorgi study, they found something very similar. Um, and they also found some benefits in, again, some blood flow adaptations also. So we, we potentially can get some really good gains um, with just the stimulation on its own, which kind of makes sense because we're stimulating the muscle. We're just taking the brain out of the factor and we're actually stimulating the muscle with the, the, the cuff on. So we're expecting to see that. And we've done some sort of case study work and pilot work with some Premier League football teams who again have basically saying that they're able to see maybe full um, attenuation of muscle mass loss in those early stages with this protocol. Um, but this is, there's early days in this. There's a lot of research still to be done. Um, I have a PhD student at the minute, Mr. Paul Head, who's doing some work in this area. And one of the things obviously with this is we haven't really, there isn't enough volume of work to be able to give us an idea of how we apply pressure just like we have with the normal blood flow. So we don't really know what are the guidelines for this type of work in comparison to normal resistance exercise. We assume they'll be the same, but we don't know. So we have to sort of research it to have a look. Um, and one of Paul's studies, it's in review. Hopefully it's been accepted soon. Um, looked at a range of, he did a, a neuromuscular stem protocol and it was like four sets of 10 stimulations. And then we looked at that alongside different percentages of blood flow restriction. So 40, 60, and 80% of your limb occlusive pressure. We looked at the change in the, the force applied from the stimulation itself, um, which declined to a similar standard as the figure you see on your screen. And then this is just um, maximal voluntary contractions immediately after the exercise as well. And you can see as we apply more pressure, we get a greater fatigue rate at the end. And this 80% is greater than the 40 and 60%. Um, and so if we go with the idea being that the more fatigue we cause, the greater the adaptation, which is some of the work that's out there, um, we would be looking towards this 80% limb occlusion pressure with our stimulation. Paul's now following that up at the minute, and he's doing a training study, and he's actually comparing the 40% limb occlusion pressure and the 80% limb occlusion pressure to try and get an understanding of whether or not what happens, the adaptations itself. And it's not fully finished yet, but some preliminary data is suggesting that there maybe isn't as much of a difference from an adaptation between the 40 and 80%. Um, so we might not need to go to this great level of fatigue. But as I said, it hasn't fully finished, so I, I, you know, I can't 100% say that's for sure, but um, I'll say when we get that data, we'll, we'll put it out there. Um, but certainly, we sort of, we're still working on that 40 to 80% limb occlusive pressure range that we do with our normal resistance exercise. Another sort of, certainly for me, this is a really interesting one in that this is just aerobic exercise or blood flow restriction. And there's more, there's lots of work being done in this. And um, there's some really good work being done by Danny Christensen in um, Copenhagen. Some recent papers he's brought out that are really, really good. Look at some of the mechanisms and so on. Um, but this is a, this has again been around for what 14 years or so. This study by Abbey and Journal of Applied Physiology, and essentially all they have is patients who are, are individuals who are walking twice a day, six days a week for three weeks, and five sets of two minutes, and um, really low intensity walking with one minute recoveries. Um, and the reason why it's really interesting is they're able to increase muscle mass up to seven percent, and also increase strength up to ten percent. Now. There's no, nobody's really doing aerobic exercise and seeing those adaptations. You'd expect to see cardiovascular adaptations, changes to performance, VO2 max, other things like that, but not the, the changes in muscle size um, and muscle strength. Um, so this is a very, it's certainly interesting in that regard. What I would say with this is the, the more well-trained someone is, I would say the less possibility you're going to get some of these adaptations occurring. Um, but certainly in an early stage rehab, it, it would certainly allow you to get some adaptations 
Um, if some, some people don't like doing resistance exercise, you know, you might want to try and get them to do something different. They also might need some cardiovascular adaptations. I said, we do see changes in VO2 max with this. We do see other performance changes. So, you know, it can be used in that regard. Um, and just like normal resistance exercise, you know, you're doing, um, percent, you know, under 100%. So the 40 to 80% limit through the pressure again, and if you're applying that pressure. Some of the other work, so we've got some recent work that's just come out. Um, we had a, an ACLR study, so um, ACL Rehab Study, Reconstruction Study, um, which was just recently published um, by Luke Hughes, who's my former PhD student, who's now doing postdoctoral work with me. Um, and we were looking at sort of two groups. You can see here on the left-hand side, we had a pre-surgery testing, then the surgery, then the test after the post-surgery, four weeks of training, mid training, and then four weeks again, and then a post-testing again. Some of the outcome with two groups, blood flow restriction and heavy load training. And we started approximately 21, 24 days after the surgery, so up to three weeks after surgery. Um, you can see the range of measurements, tenor max strength, thickness, um, a range of um, questionnaires, pain scores, joint circumference and goniometer for range of motion. And then they did their normal standard um, rehab protocol that they did within the hospital itself. And then the high load group, you worked at three sets of 10 for 70% of the one repetition max, which is obviously a lot lower than what it would have been before surgery. And then the BFR group did the 30, 15, 15, 15 scheme at 80% of their limit of pressure. So what do we see? Well, if we look at um, between group differences, we didn't see any changes pre to post um, between muscle strength or muscle thickness itself. Okay, the BFR was slightly higher in this in the strength, but actually it wasn't significantly different. We got a decrease from pre to post and it started to increase back up again in um, post surgery. But again, no significant difference between BFR and high load training. Um, and again, the same for muscle thickness. We aren't seeing any changes that we would expect to see in those early stages and um, from a strength and hypertrophy perspective. But what we did see was um, a change in some of the sort of the different functional scales. So we can see here the blood flow restriction group actually returned function a lot earlier in the in the BFR groups compared to the heavy load training. So even though they had the same strength adaptations, the same um, muscle mass adaptations, they were actually able to function better um, in themselves. And more importantly, they also had less pain. So we can see here, pain was reduced by nearly 70% compared to only 40% in the high load group. We had a greater decrease in effusion, so less swelling happening with the blood flow restriction compared to the high load group. And we also had a greater change in range of motion. We, and all three of these may explain why we've then got better functional scores. Because obviously if they've got greater range of motion, less pain obviously, um, less um, swelling, they're obviously able to function that bit better. Um, so we sort of, we're, we're quite interested in that and why we're actually seeing some of these changes. And there's been quite a bit of work in this or starting to become a, quite a bit of work in this in the fact that we've done something similar within the British military. We've done a study where again, we didn't see any differences between um, blood flow restriction and a heavy load training group for um, muscle mass and muscle strength, but we did see improvements for um, functional adaptations. So again, um, they were better at physical tasks, um, which they didn't get with the heavy load group. So the heavy load group is able to increase muscle mass and strength, but it's actually not having that crossover impact in the function, um, which is what the BFR group is seeing consistently. That sort of sparked our interest around this idea of pain then and this sort of analgesic effect. Um, and we started to look at that a little bit more. So this is from um, the same group. And this is just knee pain um, during the exercise and then 24 hours after the exercise. And you can see that knee pain is less. So this isn't, this isn't muscle pain, this is knee pain itself. And this is the first time they did the exercise. You can see that the knee pain was lower during the exercise with the BFR and the heavy load group, which isn't surprising. There's less load on the joints, so that kind of makes sense. But what's really interesting is that 24 hours later, this was still reduced. Um, 
far greater than the heavy load group. So 24 hours later, these um, participants and patients have got a lot less pain than what they did have in the, in the heavy load group. Um, and that sort of backs up some other research um, out of Aspatar in Doha. And they've um, rolled out this group over there. They've demonstrated some of that information where they were able to show reduced pain and like calephemeral pain and other things with patients um, up to sort of 45 minutes post-exercise and they followed some of Jill Cook's work and they, they did some of those studies. But we've interestingly shown it lasts for up to 24 hours with BFR. And more recently, we've just had this study published in Journal of Applied Physiology. Now, this isn't in a patient group, it's in healthy individuals, but it's looking at exercise-induced analgesia. And the reason we did it this way was we wanted to go back and have a look at non-healthy patients, or healthy patients first before we then put it into a clinical condition. And essentially, this is our dominant quadricep, non-dominant quadricep, dominant biceps, and non-dominant trapezius. So we've got lower body, upper body, and we have four groups. It was a crossover design. We have our low load resistance exercise, blood flow restriction at 80%, then occlusive pressure, blood flow restriction at 80%, and then a heavy load training group. And the time points here are pre, five minute post, and 24 hours after, okay? And if we just look at the dominant limb, low load training, actually every single training bout gives us an increase in exercise-induced analgesia um, within five minutes of exercise. It didn't matter if it was low load, high load, or blood flow restriction, everyone got a, an increase in pressure pain threshold um, within five minutes of exercise. But what's really interesting, it was only the blood flow restriction at 40, and 80% actually got that reduction 24 hours later, okay? And the other groups didn't see that, so they'd all return back to normal. So again, that's backing up our previous work in the patient groups that's showing that this um, reduction in pains lasting at least 24 hours locally within the muscle itself. If we look at the non-dominant limb, every group again is getting this response in the opposite limb that did not exercise um, five minutes post, but it's not been retained in any of the, um, at 24 hours later. And again, upper body, we're getting that increase in the sort of, um, in all groups again at 24 hours. But again, just to add, sorry, in all those groups, BFR got a slightly greater increase at all in the five minutes compared to the other conditions. So we, we can get this a short-term change in pain to the limb that was not exercised, but in the limb that is exercised, we get an even greater response and that lasts for up to 24 hours. So I say that's only, that's the first study we've done sort of looking at it and having to sort of trying to get an understanding of what's going on. Um, but there's lots of work currently ongoing in that, in that area of trying to sort of look at this. Can we get acute reductions in pain um, and maybe starting to move it into patient populations to try and understand that a bit more. I just put this up mainly because it sort of came a little bit out of nowhere at the end of last year. And I just wanted to sort of have a little chat about it very briefly in that we look at sort of things like adaptations to muscle mass and, and strength and so on. That's some of the things we're really interested in. Um, but we never really considered adaptations to the tendon. The argument always was that we, don't, we can't load the tendon with blood flow restriction exercise. It's too low intensity. Um, and actually, this work by Kubo back in 2006 sort of really put bed to anybody researching it for a long time. And they, they showed that heavy load training could change tendon stiffness, but blood flow restriction did not. And that was up until this study from Sentner in 2019, a group out of Germany. And they were able to demonstrate that 14 weeks of strength training of the Achilles tendon um, got a significant increase in both total cross-sectional area and tendon stiffness with blood flow restriction, which was of comparable nature to the heavy load training. And it sort of moved out this argument that potentially we're not getting these tendon adaptations. So it may be that we just need time for the tendon to adapt. Now, the only thing that they did do, they progressively loaded, increased the load of their um, the exercises they went through with the BFR. So they started at 20% and ended up at 35. Um, in comparison to maybe the Kugel study, just stayed at the low intensity the way through. Um, you know, I'll throw the caveat out here that this is the first study that's shown this. So, we, you know, we can't be 100%, but it's certainly interesting. And then there's a recent series of case studies that just come out 
um, in individual tendinopathies. Um, and I'm trying to remember where from, from, uh, from one of the Danish groups. And it's literally just out the last couple of days. Um, and they've shown again some really um, interesting case study work around BFR um, and tendon adaptations. So there's certainly potential there. Um, I can't say 100% that there is some potential um, improvements over the tendon. Okay, so last couple then before we finish off and if there's any questions. These are just some of the program, program recommendations that we now have done. Um, we put a paper out last year. Um, I sort of got a load of experts all over the world to sort of try and gather information to try and come to some sort of consensus about what we should and shouldn't do and so on. Um, and these are just some of them. So this is blood flow restriction with resistance exercise. Um, been through the, the frequency that we should use two to three times a week if we're going to train for more than three weeks once twice per day if we're only training for a short period of time load anywhere between 20 to 40 percent and restriction time up to sort of 10 minutes we don't want to go for longer than 10 minutes and you can release the cuff you can do more than one exercise by the way as well we just release the cuff make sure there's reperfusion and then reinflate after two or three minutes and um, two to four sets of exercise 75 repetitions at 40 to 80 percent of arterial occlusive pressure, rest 30 to 60 seconds. Um, there's a little bit of evidence that intermittent restriction may work, but probably more people who are untrained um, who just can't withstand the pain, but they just get a stimulus. So, but you would generally use continuous um, and sort of we would suggest that the rep scheme is completed. That's 75 rep scheme. There's a little bit of work around. Um, restriction exercise to failure but I would just argue that you have a greater risk of causing muscle damage and other things as well so I would probably tend to stay closer to the 75 rep scheme and not push to failure in the early stages especially with someone who's untrained or hasn't done any training history or experience. From a resist aerobic exercise in two to three times a week intensity wise it's less than 50% of your VO2 max or heart rate reserve we can go a bit longer, up to about 20 minutes. Um, continuous intervals, again, 40 to 80% of limit fluid pressure. One thing I would say is people really struggle at those higher pressures for long periods of time with, um, with aerobic exercise. So you might need to lower the pressure down there to about 60% for some people. Um, and again, exercise mode, cycling or walking. And that's only because that's where all the research has been done. But this can be done with rowing. Um, any aerobic exercise you can consider, you can do it with. Um, but just think about it smartly and wisely about why it is you're actually using it. Thank you. Okay, Stephen. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was brilliant. Are you ready for some questions now? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So uh, I will ask people to speak with you to be a little bit more interactive. So, João, do you want to step in? Again, yeah. Uh, for Stephen, uh, thank you very much for um, for your talk. It was very interesting. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear. Yes. Okay. So I, I I posted a few questions too, uh, but you kind of went on and and answered me. Uh, the the first one was in terms of uh, methodology. Uh, what do you use in terms of continuous or intermittent usage of the BFR? Because uh, I'm I'm not sure if there's if if there's any specific guideline when it comes to the, the the resting time, for example, do you keep the cuffs on during resting time or you don't? What, what kind of, uh, what, what do you think? Yeah, so all, everything we've ever done has always kept the pressure on throughout. And um, if you look back to that slide I showed at the beginning with the, the oxygenation, the risk is if you don't keep the pressure on, you return back to rest and it's just like any normal resistance exercise and therefore you end up sort of just training at a low load. Now one thing we know is we know that low load training to failure leads to the similar adaptations to blood flow restriction and heavy load training from a muscle mass perspective again but the issue becomes you have to do a lot more repetitions. So essentially all blood flow restrictions allow you to do is get to failure a lot quicker and you know you've fatigued the muscle quicker and therefore get to create that adaptation. Um, as I said, there are one or two studies which have shown that intermittent, so releasing the cuff in between for 30 seconds and then reinflating does actually work. But I think it probably in those studies, 
um, they're probably less trained individuals and therefore it's closer to their failure at 75 repetitions anyway and that's why you're getting that adaptation i can't you know i can't say for sure that's a reason but most of the research uses continuous um, restriction and then you only release the cuff after the last set so you know if you're doing that 75 repetition scheme and you do say one and a half seconds eccentric one and a half seconds concentric that takes about and 30 seconds rest in between that takes about six and a half minutes. So you don't even, you know, depend on what happens. It's normally quicker because people start doing the exercise at a rapid rate because they want it over with quicker because they, it feels sore. So um, we, we would think, you know, you're not, you haven't got the cup on for that long in general. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. And I, uh, Jean, do you mind if I continue? No. Because I, I, I wrote another one. You may, uh, but it, I may I may have misunderstood. You, you told that uh, when it comes to BFR training, you can increase the frequency of training. But uh, I, I've seen uh, a few. I, I, I'm not really sure. Uh, I think you uh, published one of those. When it comes to delayed onset muscle soreness, yeah. uh, where where does the um, the BFR stays between high intensity, low intensity, and especially when it comes to rehab because. Uh, I think you'd agree that when it comes to performance, maybe BFR is not the main tool in our box, but when it comes to rehab and mainly in the first few phases on rehab, when it comes, uh, and in, in this last part, you, 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 told, us, you told us that um, it, it doesn't give you that much of soreness, the BFR training, but where do we stand there? Do you have any? Yeah, so we, it's a bit of a mixed bag with regards to what we see. So if we look at the studies that have directly looked at muscle damage following blood flow restriction, the majority have shown they don't see muscle damage to the same extent as what you would during eccentric contractions in for the first time. Um, now, there have been one or two, there's been a recent study by Bissing um, who have shown that there is some muscle damage acutely, um, and they did see it. Um, it's hard to it's hard to get your head around why that is. Now, I would suggest it's probably because of the individuals who are used. If you have someone who's trained, you get the repeated bout effect, and that reduces muscle damage quite quickly. So, in those individuals, if they're used in a muscle damage study, well, then you're not going to see any damage. Um, you know, anecdotally, if you speak to people, some people get sore after it and some people don't the first time they've done it. So there clearly is something happening there. There is the high frequency research. Um, again, it's mainly, it's mainly been done by the Danish groups. Um, they have demonstrated damage um, with high frequency work. Um, again, there was, a, there was a study which I think they did two weeks of high frequency training once or twice a day. And then they had a, a period of rest and then they came back to the same training protocol. And what they demonstrated was damage got worse every day. And then, but when they came back two weeks later and they did the same protocol, they had no damage because of the repeated bite effect. So I think it's like everything, you need to be smart about how you apply things. And if you have someone who's never trained before, has no history of anything, um, whether that's blood flow restriction or any training, well then you don't make them do train twice a day immediately you you know you, you ease them into it gradually and um, so there you know you obviously have we're restricting blood flow to someone's limb so we have to do it correctly and we have to take care um, and some people everyone's going to respond very differently depending on who they are but um i think it's about programming correctly and making sure you give enough recovery in those early stages and um, you've obviously got time in your hand from a rehabilitation perspective and there's no need to push people too far that they're going to have um, cause damage. But I can go, if I haven't done exercise in a while and I go for a, a run, I get sore the next day. But when I go again the next day, it gets easier and easier. So we always get damage when we haven't, we've done something that's unaccustomed and we're not used to. We just have to program it correctly and start to introduce it gradually rather than just straight in. Okay, so do you think that that, that kind of uh, perceived damage or, or perceived soreness it comes uh, with training itself and not not 
because of the tools. So we ha we have no we have nothing to to point us towards not using BFR with some people. It it depends entirely in their experience and their own system of beliefs and and their their, their history of training itself. Yeah, look, I think I think there's some people potentially are, are a greater risk. We know there's questions, you know, there's the screening that you would have to do in, in the first. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, um, actually, I'll click it on. There's a screening questionnaire there that, you know, you can use and you go through and you can sort of work it out. And obviously some people are more susceptible than others. Um, but we have to, um, again, if we look at those studies, there's been a lot of stuff looking at showing that they're actually, you're no greater risk for muscle damage. Um, but it, it is a... It just depends on the individual, really. I think, and um, what you just want to do is make sure they have full recovery, and you know they actually are returning back to normal before you do the next bite of exercise. Um, you just don't want to overexert someone. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Uh, I think Gonzalo has a question as well, so I don't know if you want to. Um, question, Stephen. Yeah. Hello, Stephen. Good night. Hello. Uh, thank you. It was really good. I have two questions for you. The the first one it's about the different brands that you have with this technology. I I had tried the MedUp technology two months ago, mm -hmm. and comparing to the normal occlusion cuff uh, was, in my opinion, was really more comfortable to use it, and the um, the results were the same. Uh, I want to ask you what you think about it. Um, I know they have a little bit of big difference, especially in the price, but what's your opinion about it? And the second one was, if you don't have a Doppler uh, when you work, if you use the, the perimeter to, to know the pressure that you will use in the cuff. Okay, so um, it's a hard one to say. I don't want to say one piece of equipment's better than another. <laughs> I don't. I'm not here to endorse specific equipment brands. Um, we use. Um, I've, I've used most of them. I've tried them all at some stage, or people have sort of let me try them at some stage. And um, we use the the Delphi device generally for all our research, um, which is an American and Canadian brand. Um, the Madup system I have seen and used as well. Um, not from any of our research, but I have seen it. Um, Obviously, the the pneumatic systems are they're doing a, a, diff, a slightly different thing in that they're regulating the pressure between each bout of you know between each repetition and so on. So, um, you know, they're the inbuilt system which allows them to regulate that pressure a little bit better than the sort of handheld devices. Um, at the end of the day, a lot of them will do the same thing in that you are. If as long as you can set the pressure at the beginning and you're, you know it's standardized pressure and so on, then it will all do relatively the same thing. It really depends on who you're working with and um, what your insurance cover is a lot of the time. So, for example, in America, you know you need devices that are FDA approved. That doesn't happen in the UK, for example. But I'm not sure what it's like in in Portugal. So, you know that may come into things as well. You may have you can get away with not worrying about things like that. Um, but I said they all restrict pressure, and as long as you have worked out, so with the occlusion cup, for example, you can work out what someone's limb occlusion pressure is with a, a handheld Doppler, so that there's no problem there with using it. You know, you set up the eighty percent, and it gives a relatively similar um, response. We we did we did some research where we compared um, a handheld Doppler or a handheld pump device to a pneumatic device to and another type of device um, and obviously the pneumatic device gave a more regular pressure and um, it resulted in less pain and that's mainly because of the cuff design because it was a contoured cuff compared to a straight cuff so it fitted the limb a lot better um, but a lot of the, the handheld pump devices are now changing their cuffs to be a bit more they're increasing the quality of the cuff which is therefore meaning that they are quite good and, and can be used. So there's, there's no right and wrong. It depends on your budget and how much money you have and what you're willing to spend and what you, again, what sort of works with you in that regard. But, you know, they all generally work. No. Okay. Um, question two. Sorry, can you remind me what it was again? Sorry. Uh, if you use the, the perimeter, the perimeter uh, of a tip, for example, to, 
to know the pressure that you will use in the cuff when you don't have a Doppler. Yeah, so you can use, there's a range of things. Um, Jeremy Lonicky's group, um, they did some work where they sort of predicted and they took about 300 individuals and they, they took circumference measures, which allowed you then to work out what I think it was 60% of your limb occlusive pressure would be if you were able to take a, a, a circumference measure of the limb. I think, if I remember rightly, there's a couple of measurements you have to take. Um, so you can work out roughly what that would be. The only thing you have to be aware of that is that's a, an equation of those 300, which is then trying to apply into everyone. So it doesn't always fit, but yeah. you, you can, obviously you can do it. And it, the lower it is, is the percentage of limb occlusive pressure, the safer it will be in that, you know, if that was 80 or 90%, I'd be worried because some people would then be over 100 when they then apply it because yeah. of the variation in the equation. Um, but I think it's 60%, you're in that ballpark figure where you should be fine. Um, and you can always take 5 or 10% off the pressure to make sure it's okay and then build it up if you want. Okay, thank you. No problem. Thank you, Marcel. Andre, uh, you want to, to make your questions? Mm. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, okay. Thank you for your presentation, first of all. Uh, I was left with with a few doubts, uh, two questions more precisely. Uh, the first one is if there are any guidelines on how many exercises per session per muscle group should be performed with BFR, and or at least if there is any maximum number of exercises which are recommended to be performed with BFR. Okay, with so... Profession. There is no guidelines out there specifically looking at, and it's probably one of the areas that's really under-researched in that nobody, nobody's really went and looked at sort of doing multiple exercises over a period of time and compared it to other ones that haven't. Um, in the real world, that's different though. You know, I am aware of plenty of people who are doing multiple exercises each session in BFR. Um, there are a couple of studies which have done full body blood flow restriction, i.e. they've worked every muscle group, not all at the same time, but they've worked every muscle group and done exercises to make it work. Um, what's really interesting, and I would, I would really be honest with you, I'd strip it right back in the fact that if our ACL study that we did, we did one exercise, we did leg press for the whole time period and we got those adaptations. Could we have got more if we did more exercises? Maybe, you know, it, it's, it's hard to know. But if you look at nearly all the research They've all done one exercise. So all those changes in muscle mass that you read about, all those changes in strength that you read about is normally with one exercise over, you know, three to 12 weeks. That, you know, there's not multiple exercises. Now I understand when you have a patient in front of you, you might have to, a certain period of time you have with them and they maybe want to fill that up and do more exercises and so on. I just, I don't know if there's a need. I would probably go one or two exercises maximum. Um, again, it also depends on the exercise you choose. So for example, the leg, if we choose something like a leg press, um, that's working a lot of muscle mass. It's working the quadriceps, it's working the glutes, it's working the hamstrings, everything's being worked. If you are more isolated and you do something like a, um, a straight leg raise or you do a knee extensor, or one, then you might have to work other muscle groups. You might have to do more exercises in order to get a full, Sort of adaptation across the whole limb so i think it really depends on maybe what the injury is and what the desired outcome that you're trying to achieve is um but i don't really think if, if you're using a multi-joint exercise i think you can really can get away with using one and if you want to use more than one i would you know maybe two maximum but there's no need to be doing blood flow restriction for five or six exercises in a session i just don't really see any added benefit of it okay and Joel, can I ask one more question? Yeah, okay. Um, what's your opinion on using blood flow restriction on exercises like squats, split squats, and those kind of exercises instead of using it in machine-based, like in machine-based exercises? Yeah, so we have some work which we haven't published yet, um, but we have, um, it's been sitting on my desk for quite a while, so I'm hoping to get it published out soon. Um, we actually looked at squat, sec squat exercise um, and we were actually looking more at the biomechanics of it um, because one of, the, one of the questions I always had was um, 
we might be able to get this increase in strength, we might be able to get this increase in muscle mass, but what if it changes the way we do the exercise itself? You know, so we're in that free weight type exercise and actually it changes our motor patterns and therefore that could lead to problems if we're doing it incorrectly because of fatigue and other things. Mm -hmm. um, but we actually didn't find that was the case. We found it was fine. No, it was the same as heavy load training. There was no difference in patterns. So there wasn't a great change in how, things, um, how people moved when they did it. But obviously the only thing you have to be, you, you can do blood flow restriction with any type of exercise. You know, split squats, um, squats, normal squats, anything like that works. I have no doubt about it. The exercise doesn't okay. matter. Um, I think the thing you just have to be wary of is um, the more complex the exercise becomes, the more risk that you have of injuring yourself because of fatigue that happens with blood flow restriction. So if you imagine you've got two limbs restricted with blood flow, you've got, you can see in the background, I've got a squat rack here. You've got a squat rack yeah. and you've got your bar on your back. You start squatting and you're fatigued and you're tired and you, you can't drop the bar or whatever. We're depending on what you're doing. You then have a risk. So you maybe need people to spot you depending on. So it really depends on just who's around from a safety perspective. I think that's the biggest issue, but certainly there's people who can squat with it. There's people who do dumbbell exercise with it. There's no problem with any of that. Um, it's just a matter of making sure whoever's doing it and where you're doing it is safe for that individual. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ro. Yeah. Thank you, Andre. Uh, I have some pair of questions as well. And yeah. after, I think, Joao uh, has some questions, further questions. So my first one is, um, what do you think about the uh, individual perception of uh, the occlusion to set the, the, the occlusion to train. So, do you understand? Yeah, no, so, so, sorry, can you just what do you mean, individual perception? Like a rate perceived exertion, but, a, but about the occlusion of sensation or perception. Uh, there, I think I read somewhere that if we get like in a seven out of 10, it will be a, like, a reasonable uh, pressure to work on but sincerely i don't i don't know about that uh, yeah, so validity of yeah, the so methodology when you don't have a, of course a, a doppler yeah so this the seven out of ten um scheme is, a, is a related a lot to the the knee wrap research and how they apply their pressure and um, now i have a little bit of an issue with it in that they're they're elasticated wraps so when you go, to, for example, if I, were to, if I were to put a knee wrap on your arm now, Joao, and I was to squeeze it to 10, okay, and I was to put it to 10, and you said that's 10 out of 10, because it's elasticated, I can still pull it some more. Mm -hmm. So 10 is not quite 10. There's always more give there. And I think Jeremy's um, Lonicky's group recently did some more work where they actually um, they were – they showed that the sort of seven out of 10, there's a real variation. Some people, when they think they're at seven, are actually at four and so on, and they're not quite where they think they should be. Um, so with that side of things, when you're applying it from an ERAP perspective, I just don't agree with it. I think there's, a, there's cheap enough tools on the market that we can actually do things and we can apply our pressure correctly and so on. When we then talk about how they feel during exercise itself, so you've got reps in reserve and so on, um, I think there's, it's a bit, it's tricky because you got that 75 rep scheme and we sort of never quite know where, how far people are. It's different to reps, you know, sort of doing eight to 10 reps and so on. One of the things that we noticed um, from our pain study that we recently did, we did some moderation analysis afterwards. And what we found was that the greater the muscle discomfort, the greater the reduction in pain. So we find that if you had, if you felt it really sore within your muscle during exercise, you had a greater reduction in pain 24 hours after. Conditioning pain ventilation. So in some aspects, you want to have that, but it's localized and it disappears as soon as you release the cuff. But it's them working hard in that regard. So, so you are not a fan of flossing. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think uh, João is uh, has another another question. So João. Whatever you want. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a final one, I promise. Uh, so uh, I've seen some people, um, and I, I've seen it both ways, both 
advocating only a, a the placement of the cuff on the origin of the, for example, the lower limb. But I've also seen, and this kind of makes sense to me, some some research when it comes to using the cuff a little a little more more distal, and that you can also get some adaptations proximally to the cuff. Uh, what do you think about both questions? Do you yeah. think it's feasible to use the cuff a little a little more distal? For example, uh, why by target for uh, when you want to target, for example, the the gastrocnemius uh, in uh, in the case of uh, rehab. On the on the end on the gastrocnemius or the soleus, what do you think? Yeah, so I'll, I'll let you into a little confession. When we did our research originally on the plantar flexors, I had the cuff a little bit lower. It was still above. It was still above the knee. Um, so I've seen pictures online where people have it below the knee, and do not do that because you've got perineal nerve and you cause nerve damage, drop foot. And lots of issues can potentially happen there. So okay. I've done, I've done that. <laughs> so I it's good that you advise me. Yeah, not to de do. Definitely don't do that. Definitely don't. And to be honest with you, if I went back and did the research again on the calf, I would always place at the proximal end of the limb. And the reason being is whether it's your arm or whether it's the top of your leg, it's the fattiest part. There's more muscle mass there, and um, therefore there's less risk of damage in any nerves. If you think about it, just if I apply the pressure here, remember it's still 80% or 60%. And if it was here, it'd be a, if it was down further down my arm, it would still be that percentage, but it'd be lower because there's less circumference. So the whole limb then gets deoxygenated. So actually it doesn't matter if it's high up. It should be high up because of that sort of less risk. Um, but it also then, it just, um, it still means that the calf in that case or the forearm, whatever it is, they would still be deoxygenated, so it would still work exactly the same. So high up all times, always proximal into them. With regards to adaptations above the cuff, um, it's an interesting one, and it's a uh, it's something that always sort of people are always really interested in. Um, so it's there's two it's twofold. So essentially, there are adaptations that occur above the cuff, right? but it depends on the exercise that you choose. So if you choose an exercise where the muscle above the cuff is used in that exercise, then you get an adaptation. Okay, so if we think of a bench press, the cuffs are at the top of my arm, my triceps pre-fatigue, they get tired, therefore the chest has to take over. So there's more work being done by the chest because of fatigue happening within the triceps. If you think about a leg press or a squat, the hamstrings and quadriceps fatigue, the glutes then have to do more work in order for the exercise to continue, and therefore the adaptation occurs within the glutes. And there's evidence that both chest, back, glutes all get bigger depending on the exercise that's chosen. Now, if I do a knee extensor exercise, the quadricep will get bigger and stronger, but no other, muscle, no other muscle group is involved above the cuff. Therefore, there's no adaptation that happens above the cuff. So the only way a muscle can get bigger is if it's recruited. Okay, so if I train my right leg, my left leg does not get any bigger. Okay, if it did, we would only have to do one exercise for one body part and everywhere else would grow. And it'd be wonderful and it'd be really easy, but that's not what happens. Now, my other leg would get stronger yeah. because there's a neural transfer, but that's a different thing. So you can get some neural adaptations from a strength perspective, but you can't get a, uh, an increase in muscle mass unless the, the muscle is actually being used in the exercise itself. John, may I, may I keep yeah. going on this question? Because yeah. that, that's interesting. It's, it's plausible that some cross education, um, some cross training may go to the other limb, uh, but being plausible, do we have any research on that, or is it just uh, the fact that if you go to failure on this leg, uh, whether it's due to BFR or it isn't, I know that with BFR we have to we have to to do less repetitions. Okay, that's that's a, a good point, but is there any indication that it's uh, those those kind of adaptations may come more with the BFR or it's just some plausibility and we have 
there, there's nothing wrong with doing it. Yeah. So we, we have some, we have a little bit of evidence in that, like one of my, a couple of my studies, we used one limb with blood flow restriction as the exercising limb and then the control leg. And um, they did just low load, but not the failure, which we know doesn't lead to an adaptation. But consistently, we see a three or four percent increase in strength in the other limb. The flea if our leg's still heavy, but we get a, a three or four percent increase in strength. Um, and that happens, and that's happened in multiple studies. There have been one or two studies which have looked at training the lower body and getting an adaptation in the upper body. And um, there was a study by Madarami, um, a Japanese study back in the early 2000s. And again, they did demonstrate, they say that you do get an increase in muscle mass in the biceps, but nobody's been able to demonstrate it since. We don't really understand what happened or, I don't believe, because no one's been able to sort of replicate it. Um, Stuart Warmington group out of um, Australia actually replicated the study. And I think he did demonstrate some strength increases upper body. But again, that's because of a neural transfer, but they're very small. If you use, heavy load training, you would get a greater neural adaptation cross transfer. Um, and one of the things that if we were looking at doing our work again within the ACL rehab would be first for the research study, we did both legs injured or not, did blood flow restriction. And then in the other group, both legs did heavy, but that was just to stop, stop any cross education because otherwise we would have confounded the results and we wouldn't have known which one did what, but in the real world, I would argue that you do one limb with blood flow restriction, the injured limb, and then you do the other limb, heavy load training, and I think you would get greater improvements in strength in the injured limb alongside the BFR. Perfect, thank you. Okay, okay. nice. Uh, I just have a last question, I think. I think we talked about, oh, we've talked about a little about the, 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 the tendons. Yeah. One, we are in the, doing BFR uh, sessions or, or cycles. Uh, but you advocate that there are adaptations in the tendons or just that doesn't have any danger uh, injury-wise? So the, that new study by Sentner, which is, trying to go back, sorry. Um, it says here they've, they've demonstrated that they get the same adaptations in tendon cross sectional area and tendon stiffness of the Achilles and um, with blood flow restriction that they do with heavy load training after 14 weeks. Um, so it's the only study that's done it. So, you know, I can't, I can't sit here and say this is definitely the response. You can't, you know, make that argument after one study. And um, considering that this study by Kubo didn't see that change. Um, so, we can't be 100%, but the data is good. It's in a really good journal. It's been through the peer review process well. Um, and again, there's some research coming out now which is potentially showing that. When I first started doing this, the one thing that always came back to me was, well, Kubo demonstrated that you don't get a tendon adaptation, but the muscle gets bigger. Are we putting the tendon at risk because it could get too big and too strong for the tendon? My argument's always been no, because we're not using it for long enough that that's going to happen. Okay. It's also because it's being a little bit naive and thinking that we only do one thing all the time, i.e. we only just do resistance exercise and nothing else. Um, if we do, we know the tendon gets loaded with multiple things, you know, people walking, running, jumping, hopping, all these different things that happen. So therefore, um, in the real world, we would use other parameters to load the tendon as well. So um, that's never been a concern of mine that we aren't sort of, we're underdoing the tendon. And this work is starting to suggest, well, maybe there's something happening here. I think what happens is we don't normally, it depends on the injury, but you wouldn't even need necessarily to have blood flow restriction for 14 weeks solid without introducing something else. So the argument always becomes, so what and who cares? Do you, do you know what I mean? What, what is a, this is a really nice study that it gives us a really good physiological understanding, but actually in the real world, very rarely do we use it for this long. Mm -hmm. therefore the tendon's always going to get an adaptation because you transfer into heavier load training and we get the adaptation there anyway so like you said you don't use if you are uh, as a methodology for a prolonged uh, time uh, all right the goal is to, to step in in the heavy heavy load training okay the, i think that's the, the message 
Yeah, and there's a study that just came out today um, that I literally just seen that came up on my Twitter account um, before I came on here. Um, and again, it was one of the Danish groups again, and they did the, they did a heavy load training group the whole way through, and then they had a heavy load training group for, say, three weeks, and then they intermittently used blood flow restriction for a few weeks and then back to heavy load. So they almost deloaded with blood flow restriction. And what they were able to show was that that group was still able to maintain muscle mass and cross-sectional area of the type 2 fibers to the same extent as heavy load on its own. So where you can potentially use blood flow restriction is also as a deload. You know, so you can start to deload the stress and then actually, but you're still maintaining mass and strength alongside it. Um, but all day long, heavy load training gives you the most adaptations and what you're actually trying to always do. Yeah, I think that's the main message we have to we have to to deliver everyone. Sean, do you want to do you want to to ask? Just just a, just a quick fire question. Uh, uh, Brad Schoenfeld, I think, posted today or yesterday uh, a new uh, study, a new article on BFR. Have you seen it? And uh, if you have, what do you think of it? I I wasn't able to read it uh, I, yet. I haven't read it yet. Um... I, I seen it. I seen it come out. Um, is it around the bodybuilding? I uh, I think it was on uh, yeah on the physique athlete. I I wasn't able to read the abstract yet. Also, I, I haven't. I seen it come out. I just haven't had a chance to look at it yet. So I I'm not a hundred percent on what to sort of look at. And um, I think it's a I think it's a um, theoretical one of how it could be used. Um, but I'm I'm sure I'm sure there'll be good information in it. But I just haven't had a chance to read it yet. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we don't have any more questions. So, Stephen was a big pleasure. I think it was a brilliant presentation. Uh, everybody now has a, a clear idea what is BFR and how to use it, especially in, in our context of rehabilitation. So, we are very thankful for that. So, hopefully, we will see you again. And if you need anything, Just, just say, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You.